very good morning, church. Once again, we want to welcome you to our online service this morning. As today is Palm Sunday, I just want to read uh, John chapter 12, the triumphant entry, okay, verse 12 to 15. The next day, the last crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on the donkey's coat. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, wonderful Father. Let's lift our voices as we begin to worship Him and pray in the Spirit.
Once again, we want to welcome you to our SCD online service. Uh, you are not from this church, you are from somewhere out of Malaysia. We want to welcome you in the name of the Lord. Amen. This is a quick announcement. Uh, this Tuesday, we are uh, resuming our SOD class on end time. Okay, so at 8.30, uh, please, uh, please sign in five minutes earlier so that I can uh, assign you to a breakout room. Okay? The Zoom ID is the same and the password is n times the same also. So we are studying on lesson four this coming Tuesday. So to join us. The next one is uh, this Friday. It's Good Friday. Amen. And uh, it's on 2nd April, Friday. So we will have our Good Friday on Zoom service, uh, online service to Zoom. The ID is 890-3123-1677. Uh, passport is CROSS. Its speaker is Pastor Sandy, who will be speaking. And after the message, we will uh, have a Holy Communion together to remember the lost death. 2000 years ago. So, we also will live stream the, uh, the Zoom service. Okay, you can also watch from the Facebook uh, channel. Okay, so, but do join us through Zoom uh, so that we can interact with each other. And then the next one is good news after six months of uh, lockdown <laughs> from uh, uh, worshiping from home. We, will, we are glad to inform you that FCD will reopen our on-site service next Sunday, which is a Resurrection Sunday. Amen? So, uh, it's on uh, April the 4th. And uh, we will also live stream the service to the Facebook channel, same as what you're watching now. And so those of you who to join us on-site, uh, please register to your cell leader. Uh, starting from tomorrow, the, the registration will open tomorrow and uh, and those of you who are not from any CG, you can text Margaret, phone number uh, 012-255-3130 or my hand phone number 019-267-8920. Okay, please sign me uh, latest by Thursday 1pm so that we can do all the uh, Logistic, the how many, how many, uh, how many people uh, were coming for that on-site service, and uh, we want to tell you that we have been, we are able to increase the uh, capacity because of the new SOP. You no longer, no longer require for 2.5 meter physical distance, just one meter. Uh, so we have now 45 uh, uh, people. Okay, and worship on on-site service. So that's the good news. So, so do join us and register to your cell group, the leader, or uh, non cell member to Margaret or me. Okay, so we hope to see you uh, next Sunday after six months. <laughs> so since October, the first week, we have, we have closed for on-site service. So we are glad to see you again. To worship together on the Resurrection Sunday. Okay, the next one is uh, tithes and offering. Once again, we want to thank you for your continued support and giving to the Lord uh, of His work, uh, for His work, uh, the church. And uh, we want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. And uh, you can do so to online transfer to our FD Bahad May Bank account number. Sai one two two three one five one three six hundred. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you for your faithfulness in this difficult and challenging time that we're in. Yet you are faithful in providing for all of us. And even as we give back a portion of what you have blessed us with, and we, we sow it back into your kingdom for the furtherance of your kingdom. And Father, we want to pray a blessing for every individual, for every family. Lord, we ask God that you continue to watch over them, continue to bless them physically, emotionally, spiritually, and continue to watch over them and going out and coming in, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. 
Amen. Okay, one more thing. We, we want to take this time, this short moment to pray, uh, especially for Myanmar. Uh, yesterday was the darkest day for Myanmar. Uh, on one day, there were 98 people were killed. Uh, for the people who are protesting against the military coup. Okay, and uh, so many lives are lost so far now, about 300 people. A lot of them are, are graduate uh, UNC students. And uh, so join with me from your home and let's just pray for them. And we have actually a few pastors that we connected with in Yangon and uh, Tonggu. So let us pray even at this moment from your home and join our hearts together and pray. Father, we just want to lift up before you. We call upon your name, the name that is above every name. Father, we want to intercede and stand again for the land of Myanmar, the nation of Myanmar. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, just as most of the Israelites called out upon you during that uh, slavery in 400 years in Egypt. They call upon your name, O oh God, that you will send them a deliverer, a Moses to deliver them out of their oppression. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that God, we don't know how you're going to do it, but Lord, we know that you are God Almighty, that you will raise up, Lord, deliverer, to deliver them out of this oppression by the military. Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus, we pray and continue for your protection on the people. We pray, Father, for the blessed to stop in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for, Lord, for the democracy to return to the nation of Myanmar in the name of Jesus, Lord. Father, we call upon your name, Father. We ask of you, Lord, send for your angels, O oh God, into that nation, O oh Father. Send for, Lord, your deliverer to deliver them out of this oppression in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Uh, this morning we have uh, Elder Calvin to come and share with us the Word of God. Let's put our hands together as we welcome Elder Calvin. Sorry, not 28, it's wrong. 
Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Typo error. Ah, suddenly I realized. Okay. So the verses is here. It's uh, in the screen here. So, can you all uh, remember this verse? I tell you when I, I, I prepared for this message, uh, I began to like meditate on it. And it's like memorizing the verses. And now you can literally remember. It says, come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. These three verses we are going to look at it this morning, and I would like uh, to invite you to go over it with me in a, what you call it, a reflective or meditative mode as we go over these few verses. So, okay, so basically, this morning we are going to look at this short passage. And uh, from heaven, Jesus himself, okay, is personally extending this divine invitation to all of us. And this divine invitation is, is divine rest all who are who labor and are heavy laden and he will give you rest. But many of us today are still lacking comprehensive understanding and thus unable to experience and appropriate Jesus divine gift of rest promised to all. So, let's have a glimpse over what are the intent and the desires of Jesus himself when he made this invitation. In other words, what motivated Jesus or motivated Jesus to make this invitation? I could only see compassion and mercy for the people, not only at that time, and even to us today as his motivation. What is this rest that is offering to all? And how can one come into experience of receiving his promise of this divine rest? And what would it be like when one is able to find rest for our souls? These are some of the questions we can ponder. And if possible, I suggest that you take the Take a pen and a paper and jot down, jot down whatever thoughts or question that pops up in your mind as we are examining the passage for this morning. And that will be the seed for your daily reflection. And not only daily reflection, it can be also for your daily conversation and the prayer with the Lord which, uh, as you go through the week. And I titled this message as Jesus' Tender Invitation to divine rest for all. There are some preliminary uh, questions which I'd like to pose to you for pondering. The first one is, uh, who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Very important. What do you say, okay, uh, to whom is this uh, invitation extended to? And what is this offering to those who are accepted? What? What will he expect from those who desire to respond to his invitation? And most important, how can we accept this rest that he has promised? And how do we know we have it already? So in the background uh, for this passage is actually taken from Mark 20, 11, 25 to 30, which is about five verses. Uh, Matthew 11 follows Jesus' instruction to the disciples about taking his message and miracles to the town of Israel with his own continued ministry of teaching, starting from chapter 10. Jesus answers, after that he answers uh, some questions from John's disciples and in, in answering it, he also upholds John's ministry. He commended John for who he was. He was being the forerunner. And after that he also condemned several cities in Galilee for rejecting his teaching despite obvious signs and one of them was his 
in the Tegernum, where he, he used to have his headquarters. And from verse 25 onwards, Jesus thanked his father. It's like sort of prayer like that, okay, a conversation, for hiding the truth from those who are wise and understanding according to the world. This implication is that those who are arrogant assume their own wisdom and miss the truth because they aren't really looking for it. Instead, God will reveal truth to those the world dismiss as children or those who doesn't know anything. Jesus declares that he and the Father knows each other completely and he can reveal the Father to anyone he chooses. After that, he invites those listening, anyone, including all of us, in today's context, who are weary and weighed down in the sense of the Pharisees' extra rules and requirements to take on his yoke and find rest for their souls. So let's, I will try to break it up into three verses only. Okay, the three verses, as you can see, is on, the, on top of the slides. The first one is, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus' tender invitation to divine rest. And this one, Come to me, shows Jesus Jesus showed his authority when he says, come to me. This invitation is unthinkable in the mouth of anyone else but God. Oh, and woe to the man who call people to themselves instead of to Jesus. Jesus drives none away. He called them to himself. His favorite word is come. Not go to Moses, not go to John, but come to me. To Jesus himself we must come, Spurgeon said. And uh, by a personal trust in him, not to doctrine, ordinances, nor ministry, we are to come first, but to the personal Saviour, Jesus Christ our Lord. The question I wish to bring to you for further pondering this morning is, who then is Jesus to you personally? Is he just my saviour or my assurance to secure a place in heaven when I respond to the invitation call to salvation in 1970, that was in the 1970s? The truth coming down from this revelation is very critical for me to help me to form core beliefs in my life. Otherwise, I may be tossed to and fro by base of the sea of doctrines, the lies of the enemies, or even misleading worldviews, which once I thought was the truth. So in Matthew chapter 16, verse, I think it's 13 onwards. Yeah, it started at 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? I, the Son of Man, am. And which Jesus just asked his disciples, you know, Who do the people say I am? Wow. So, <laughs> so we know the answer, is it? So how does the disciples answer? Some say, you are John the Baptist, some says Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. You'll be surprised. Many of us, even I myself, was unable to articulate when he was asked. And I was asked this question. Suddenly so it just jumped on me. Yeah, at the back of my mind, I mean, I can easily cut the, the answers from my head. After being a Christian for so many years, I can say, oh, he's my savior, he's my provider, he's my healer, my father, my teacher, my guide, my friend. But deep down in your heart, who do you think is Jesus to you? 
There is no right and no wrong answers. Only you and you alone knows for yourself who Jesus is. Based on the life experience and encounter that you had with Him, you should know Him. If you happen to be like me, one who is not sure who Jesus is in my life despite being a Christian for 30 over years, well, the good news is it is never too late. Okay? You can approach any of the pastoral team, okay? Even Pastor Joshua, Sandy, Elders, Associate Minister, or even PCM Ministry A, CGL leaders, whom you can look up to, okay, and ask them, and they will be glad and able to help you and guide you in your spiritual quest to find the answer to this question. Who is Jesus to me? <laughs> because it is very important. If you do not know who is Jesus to you, then you are going round and round. Coming back to Matthew 16, verse 13 to 18, I want to restate the same question that Jesus eventually directed to his disciples and likewise also to us today, individually this morning. Who do you say I am? Jesus asked, Who do you say I am? Tell me, he says, Jesus asked me, Tell me, who do you say that I am? It doesn't bother what other people say. But I want to hear you tell me who you say I am. Jesus has been giving many object lessons along the way during the three years that he was with his disciples. He's gently helping them to articulate their core beliefs, to describe their own relationship with Jesus himself. Practically, it is quite easy and straightforward. Why? How, why do I say that? There's no rocket science in this process. Just like, you ask me, who is Margaret? Straight away I can tell you she's my wife, the meek one, the one whom God has given to me, my competency, my home director, my lover, my, my girlfriend, and all the things that she appears in different perspective to me because I already knew her for so many years. So, the same goes with Jesus. You would be able to tell straight away who Jesus is to you if you recall your own walk, your own spiritual walk and experience with Jesus. How he has appeared to you, how he has called you out of darkness into light. The day you give your life to Him, the answer, the, the invitation to salvation. Okay? And Simon Peter answered and said, look at how Simon Peter answered that in the Bible. Simon Peter answered and said, You are Christ, the Son of the Living God. Actually, Simon Peter knew all the opinions of the crowd. He has been moving around with Jesus, and these are the feedback that he that means he's on the ground's classroom already. Okay? But what happened? Though he, he knows that these are the, the feedback from the ground, though all these are complementary towards Jesus, oh he's the, the prophet, he's the Elijah, he's John the Baptist. But it wasn't accurate as far as Peter is concerned. Jesus was much more than that, okay? More than John the Baptist, more than Elijah, more than the prophets, more than even a national reformer and a miracle worker. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and the Son of the Living God. This one, if you do not know, you have to go back and just ponder and just reflect and chew on it and ask yourself, Lord, what does it mean when, you, when people say you are the Christ? I really do not know. Can you show what it means, O oh Lord, that it says that you are this, you are that? But I want to know you personally. I want to really know who you are for my own life. I don't want to say what people say, okay? I just want to know from my own heart. And then for Peter, therefore, what happens? He knew, okay? He understood that Jesus was not only God's Messiah, but God Himself. Though like many of us, only in the head initially, Peter only knows Jesus in the head initially, instead of in the heart. Why do I say that? 
because he used to be very, uh, uh, very, what do you call it? Life wire like that. Whatever comes into his mind, he will stop, he, he will respond. When Jesus says, oh, I'm going to be going up uh, now, it's almost a time. Uh, <laughs> before that, Jesus already revealed to them three times, no, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and will be uh, persecuted and tortured by the elders and the Pharisees. I will be crucified and on the third day I shall rise. But they have not listened to him. You know, why? Three, three times God has, uh, Jesus has told them, but none of them is listening. And then Peter, when, uh, when he was told one time, never, Lord, I will, I will, I will, I will obey thee. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, get thee behind me, you say that. Because he was having his own mind's opinion and his own idea of who Jesus is and what Jesus is coming to do. Likewise, we all have our own ex based on all the feedback received from uh, in our head, we form opinions and we form draw rationalize who Jesus is, but we haven't really know in the depths of our heart who Jesus is. Okay, until Jesus restored Peter. Yes, he mean he, he denied Jesus Three times he was foretold by Jesus and he went away, he tried to turn it and Jesus resurrected. You know what he did? Yeah, he, 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 he can even run to the tomb and see, oh, empty tomb and all that. But after that, what happened? He said, in the morning, so, well, let's go fishing. <laughs> and all, he's he being a natural leader and all the other disciples also followed him. Go fishing. And it was during that time Jesus encountered him. I want to help put this point in all my life, including all your life. It is God coming to encounter us. But we have to be in the know, in the affair that God comes. And then Jesus prepare the fire and then come back and then Peter comes, okay, and caught no fish. They caught the no fish and tell them to throw it in there. Then they caught a lot of fish. They cut the long story short. Jesus restored Peter when he asked him the question, Peter, do you love me three times? I think that uh, if they have not answered this question like Peter, it is also a good thing for reflection and pondering. In your quiet time, just let yourself hear. Kevin Ma, do you love me? <laughs> First start. And see how you answer it, okay? Then you go. I'm not sure though. Yeah, just be honest, it's okay. Then ask and see how you answer. So Jesus asking after asking, asking him three times, Jesus really come to realize he actually loved Jesus the way Jesus loves him. And as a result, he has been restored. Okay? And uh, he says, it's, it's not only uh, in his head, he's now knowing Jesus, it's no longer merely a head knowledge and passing events of experiences, but rather the heartfelt and deep knowledge which helps not only to transform his life, but also his entire paradigm change that Jesus is concerned to him. His seal, his call, his mission and his mission ministry. He arrives from being fearful to bold and courageous creature in Christ. Indeed, all true Christian knows Christ and not with a mere theoretic, theoretical hate knowledge which may be obtained from both but with the knowledge which the Holy Spirit works in the heart, can we truly say we know Jesus in the glory of His person, in the perfection of His work, in the riches of the wondrous grace? We not only know Jesus Christ, but we need Him. And the longer we live, the more we need Him. We need, every, we need everything in Christ or that Christ has. We need His blood to cleanse us, His righteousness to clothe us, 
His Spirit to sanctify us. We need Christ every day, daily, hourly, in our spiritual journey. Here and now, not after we, we've gone home. Okay? Yes. And as we need Christ, so we come to Christ, not just once for all, but we continually need to come. We must come to Him in every trials of us, in every trouble, in every conflict, in every sicknesses, to unburden our minds, to find rest for our souls. We need Him for wisdom, for strength, and for holiness. Much of the encounters with Him, okay, is the relationships, our relationships that arises from coming daily and hourly to Jesus. I'm telling you, every day, you will encounter Him when you come to Him. What does it mean to come? It means to believe, to receive, to eat, to drink. There are some verses I don't want to. To look, to confess, to hear, to enter into a door, and to open a door, to even touch the hem of His garment, like the lady who has the issue of blood. To accept the gifts of eternal life through Christ our Lord. In summing that book, come to me is likened to an invitation to knowing, to a knowing relationship with Jesus Christ, not in my head, but in my heart. That I may know, and I may know, and I may know. Okay, sorry, I didn't <laughs> okay. okay, I've come. So the second one, all you who are labored, who all you who labor and are heavy laden. Why? Uh, isn't, isn't that <laughs> later than only you can understand, okay? The, 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 the paradox. It's very paradoxical, in, in fact, in this passage. All, he says, what does it mean all? I like to put to you this morning that all literal means or general means all with no exception. None is ascended. And yet in this present context, the all in a sense restricted, restricted by Jesus' statement to the humble souls who acknowledge their weariness or struggling with not only sins but anxieties arising from the cares of life, like sicknesses, emotional, mental, or even spiritual anguish. The all of is God's all mercy and dito, merciful and dito. For the horrible all of Romans 6, uh, no, Romans 3, 23, where Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus is speaking to a Jewish audience, but with the all, he flings open the gates of salvation to sinners from every tribe, every tongue, and every people, every nation. As a Gentile believer, I am truly grateful to Him for this all from the lips of the Redeemer of mankind. So who are you? Who are the you? Okay? The you is very simple. It's the sinners, the people who out there who doesn't know Him, as He says that, and the repentant, the repentant are those walking, going in their spiritual journey, and yet being lambasted and wow by all sorts of cares and all sorts of things overwhelming in life. You just think of all the things. I think if you say, wow, I'm very happy, no anxiety, no barriers, no burden, you tell me, <laughs> I want to be a disciple this morning. I want to learn from you how to, how to be like that, okay? But it says, uh, really, as Jesus said elsewhere, it is not the spiritually well who needed a decision, but the spiritually sick. Do you even see your, your need to come to Jesus? In order to truly come to Jesus, a person must admit that he is burdened with the way of sin and care. 
Only those who acknowledge that they are, they are lost can be saved. As discussed earlier, while Jesus' invitation is especially a call to come to Him for salvation, the call is also applicable to saints who are weary in their struggle to live the Christian life in their own strength. So, in short, we are not supposed to live our life in our own strength. Okay, just as the, what we learn from this verse, come to me. Okay, okay. And uh, weary. What does that mean? Weary. Weary, figuratively, weary means to become emotionally fatigued, discouraged, thus to lose heart or to give up. The present tense represents the pathetic picture of one who is persistently, physically weary and tired, spiritually exhausted, discouraged, and even ready to throw in the towel. I can tell you, I was one of them. I almost threw in the towel also, but thank God, by His grace, He helped me to find this verse. And, uh, okay. And I'll give you rest. Okay. This is interesting. I'll give you rest. Note that we are not invited to come to a doctrine which is systematic as a good, which is as good and necessary as that might be, but to a Savior who is divine. That is very important for us to know. To the person of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, who is our rest. Are you learning how to abide in Him, to rest in Him? If not, you will grow weary. And even of doing well, doing good, you will also get weary. It seems that many of the God's children are growing weary of following Jesus. Wow. We just, we just had our uh, end times in it. The great falling away of the, of the I forgot how much that word will be. Okay? many of those. And similarly, many of them are falling away. And are being swept into the bypass, the bypass of technologically tempting but temporal world system which is hated by Satan. Okay? So we look at all the things, there are so many distractions, so many attractions which distract. As a result, many of God's children are restless. Restless means weary and heavy laden and desperately need to hear and to heed Jesus' sweet call to come to me. And He will give rest. The world can neither give nor understand. And I like Paul in his, in his passage, it's not that. Uh, Philippians 4, uh, verse 11 to 13. Okay, Paul gives a clue how we can learn to abide and show us the proofs of this learning from this passage. He said, Paul says in verse 11, Not that I speak from, I, uh, from one, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I think we have no rest. Sometimes we are chasing other things that is not meant for us. Or we chase other ones rather than we go for needs. So this, this way we create a lot of no rest for ourselves. But Paul is able to do it. Here are some of the test questions you can use as checklists on whether you are in rest, in the rest of Jesus Christ. One question one, do you give thanks in every circumstances? Good time, bad times. Recently my car was giving me problems for the past since January 22nd, January 22nd, until about last week. You know? Actually it really bothers me. But now I can see, I look at it from a different perspective. I say, no. Why? Because I go back to all the difficult times of my life. And I start to count them and see how God has dealt and helped me out of it. Then I say, Lord, you have done all that. What is my car? I'm going to surrender it to you. And you lead me to how to resolve it. And that is rest. 
really practically rest. Okay? And do you consider it all joy when you counter various trials? When you are sick? Yeah, when you are good and walking around, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But when you are sick, and one of your loved ones is dying, can you still consider coming all joy? As you practice these disciplines, I, I like this word to hear, it says, Joy and not thanksgiving is a discipline you and I need to put into our life. It's not just we pack it and as and when we need. We need. Okay, as you practice this discipline of gratitude and joy, you will come more and more rely on the indwelling and enabling power of the Holy Spirit that you will begin to learn the secret of the Christ life. And verse 12, Paul says, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering needs. And verse 13, he says, I can do all things through him who strengthened me. Paul has given us this, okay? As a guideline how we can apply it in our life. I will, he says, uh, come to this. Rest then is a divine peace. But know that Jesus' promise of rest is conditional. Even in this, in this verse you can see, it's conditional. It is conditional on the individual making the personal choice to come. At his feeling. Okay? Jesus, just like our Father in heaven, is gentle and humble in heart. And so he will not call us or force us to come to him against our will. Even if go lay wavered in our ways, he will still have the patience to wait for you to come back. I was once wavered, and he has been waiting for me, and I'm thankful for that. Then he says, Come, Christ says, and I'll give you rest. I will not show you the rest, nor barely tell you of rest, but I will give you rest. I'm faithfulness itself and cannot lie. I give I will give you rest. I will have the greatest power. I who have the greatest power to give it, the greatest view to give it, the greatest right to give it. Come, laden sinners. And I, Jesus says, will give you rest. So this morning, if you and I are heavy and laden, you know, nobody can know, only you yourself know, you come. Rest is the most desirable goods, okay? The most suitable goods, and to you, the greatest goods, come, Christ says, and that is to believe in me and I will, give, I will give you rest. I will give you peace with God and peace with conscience. I will turn your storm into everlasting calm and I will give you such rest that the world can neither give to you nor take from you. Learning to rest, this is it. Many Christians are anxious and troubled and although they are experiencing the rest of salvation that accompanies the forgiveness of sins and are looking forward to eternal rest of heaven, their souls okay, are still in turmoil. Why? Because they are fearful and doubting. They seem to be continually burdened by life's problem. A closer look at their anxiety can reveal the reason for their distress. Having never learned to rest in the Lord, they fail to experience the quietness and the confidence that comes to those who daily fellowship with Him through prayer and study of the Word. Have you learned to rest in Him today, this morning? When we put our problem in God's hand, he puts his peace in our hearts. The next verse, 
It says, wow, this is interesting. The next verse, the whole thing is up there. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You just meditate on this one, right? If you are very busy, then I just don't you know, just meditate on this. Take my yoke upon you. I was asking, Lord, why do you ask me to take your yoke? I'm already so heavy, little still want to ask some more. But then he says, what Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Then I say, learn what? He says, for oh, I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. I tell you the day I was so overwhelmed by my side. Uh, in my former self, in my old self, when I can't handle the situation, I've been trained to run. It's part of life, how you, how you encounter problems. They are calling uh, what you call it? You either embrace it or you fly. My tendency is I fly. I go make all sorts of excuses and say I cannot. I, because I don't embrace it. But here it says, uh, learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart. So I was so overwhelmed by the anxiety. Lord, how to handle? It's so tough. And then uh, I tried last year, you know. But then it, it's got worse. And, and the worst thing is, it ended up so bad. When things go bad and worse, stuff, there are many ways to respond. For myself, I don't know about me. I beat myself up and I, I run myself down until I become so nothing is left. But now, when I bring this issue to God, then He says, You take my yoke. I say, Lord, what is your yoke? What is your yoke? I say, my yoke, I know, but what is your yoke? Precisely, what is Jesus' yoke? But as I think about it, I say, Lord, you, not, you literally have no more yoke. <laughs> you are carrying it to the cross, and you are laid upon there, and now you are resurrected. You didn't take it along with you, but He has gone through it, and He knows it. So therefore now, He is giving His divine yoke in exchange for my yoke. Mine is the mortal yoke. Okay? And he says, take it upon you. The yoke, uh, in the olden days, you know, uh, it's always uh, it's a, it's a harness to harness two cows to move together. So then the, 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 the things still get going and, and both of the cows, uh, if you just take away one, and one cannot move properly. But you harness two, uh, two will be going very smoothly. So, and the best thing is now, I'm not harnessed to a cow. <laughs> I'm harnessed to the Divine One who has the Divine capabilities in mind and who is answers to all. Cares in life. That's the difference. So this is the... And this, uh, in this verse itself, I uh, like this one, it's, it comes with three, three uh, main command. Come, take, and learn. Okay? And each call for a choice to respond. And in this response, I have to surrender. I have to say, yes, Lord, there's nothing else I can do anymore. But it's only you that can, can do for me. Okay? So, take my yoke. Believe me, you have to willingly surrender yourself to his lordship, to submit to his rule. And uh, to take Christ's yoke upon us signifies the setting aside of my own will and completely submitting to his sovereignty. Not only my will, even my own agenda, my own preconceived ideas. Why do I get so work up because I, I pick up all my preconceived ideas, my past bad experience, but now I have to let them all go, okay, and submit that. The, and the acknowledging of the Lordship in a practical way, Christ demands something more than lip service from his followers, his disciples. 
especially a loving obedience to his command. And learn from me. What am I to learn from Jesus to become a in this uh, word a learner is actually uh, there's a Greek word here, it which means it's a disciple. And literally meaning learning to imitate the masters. Okay, the sharp mind is the end of discipleship. Therefore, when we come, we have to come with our open mind. And uh, this learning has the basic meaning of directing one's mind to something and producing an eternal effect. And Learn refers to teaching, learning, instructing, and discipling. And learn means to genuinely, genuinely understand and accept the teaching, to accept it as true and apply it in one's life. It was something used of acquiring a, long, a lifelong habit or discipline. So we have to use this learning to be part of our discipline, lifelong process. For I'm gentle and lowly in heart. This gentle and lowly in heart is a divine trace that helps us to understand why his yoke is easy and his burden is light. For he is not harsh nor filled with pride, and he will not oppress us or give us a burden to break like uh, to break for us, too great for us to carry. Jesus presented a striking contrast to the Jewish audience who were well acquainted with the Pharisees, who were harsh and proud, the antithesis of Jesus to be yoked with one who is gentle and humble is also to learn to take the lowest place. And uh, some, this, uh, the only way to truly define gentle is meekness and is in the context of relationship because it refers to how we treat others a gentle spirit should characterize our relationship both with man and with God that's why it's very important I remember when Jesus was, uh, was asking Lord what is meant by gentle and lowly in heart then I realized how haughty I have been how Rash I have been. Even by making opinions of the, the past experience or the person or labeling the person, oh, I can't work with him because it's like that, like that, like that. But when I surrender, I really was able to come into rest. Humble in heart, what does it mean? Humble in heart, you look at Moses, is the best uh, portrayal of humility in heart. Moses helped us to understand this trait. He was described by God as a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of earth. What is Moses doing while Miriam and Aaron were criticizing him? Nothing. He first record, his first recorded words in Numbers 12, 13 were, He cries out, O oh Lord, heal her. It is at this point that we see Moses' greatness. Moses' mindset has certainly effects which can help us to determine if we are me. Why? Because he didn't fight back, he didn't answer his critics, he didn't get angry, he didn't seek revenge, he didn't argue or try to explain his action, he didn't complain about his unfair treatment, instead he kept silent and let the Lord take up his cause. He only opened his mouth to pray for Miriam. So, if you want this rest, to find your rest, this is one of the secret. These are the traits that we are to learn from our Savior if we indeed want to rest. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Ah, I like this one. As I mentioned just now, how I asked the question, Lord, how? He says, for, for, for my yoke is easy. He says, why? And what is the purpose of for here? How is this yoke easy and the burden light? 
the more you practice the art of asking the scripture, I would say also in this process is called meditating, pondering, reflecting, questions, okay? The more you will find yourself experiencing the joy of self-discovery. As your teacher, who's your teacher then? The Holy Spirit interacts with you and illumines the passage for you. That's why I say, I challenge all of you to go and meditate on this passage, even after this week. Just think about it. Lord, I'm very weary. I got a lot of burdens in my life. I want to experience rest as you have promised. Because your yoke is light. In the first place, Jesus knows the yoke that you carry. It can be yoke of legalism. We are having our Friday CG on in the Mark, in the book of Mark. The, there was a lot of legalism about the Pharisees and what they should do, the, 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 the rules and the laws of the elders instead of the, law, the commandment of God. Okay? It's the same thing. So the legalistic yoke of man brings bondage which steals the joy of our salvation. Every morning, we need to arise and make the, the prayer choice, prayer to choice to take up and put on Jesus' life, easy and grace-filled yoke, and experience His liberating joy, peace throughout the day as His Spirit enables us to live as those who know the truth and are indeed free. Hence, we are able to experience Easy yoke, which is and also the burden is light. How is that? And my burden is light. In in the New Testament, the Greek word used for burden denotes the trouble of these troubles of this life. In Matthew 23, verse 4, Jesus described the heavy burdens for they are. For the Pharisees laid upon the people, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Obviously, this is the burden of legalism. The same great word used is, is used to describe man's load of imperfection and sins. Okay, in Galatians 6 5. Jesus uses the same word to describe this burden. And in, Jesus says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. The reason for having a light burden and is described in the previous verse. I am gentle and humble in heart. Burdens will come in this life, but there will be light if we have Jesus' approach to life, being gentle and humble in heart. How is your burden this morning? Are there light in Jesus' case or heavy? Jesus contrasts this heavy laden, okay, with the light, uh, heavy laden burden with the light burden. And it's up to you whether which one you choose. Do you notice the seemingly, seemingly paradoxical call of Jesus to all, to all, to an already all weary and burdened man or woman to take on a new load, and that in order that they might receive rest, only Jesus can orchestrate such a supernatural week because he is the rest personified in the yoke and in the burden which he is offering to you in the divine rest. Okay. Application after going through this verse. So, got a quick review of this verse without looking at it, I try to say Come to me, all you who are labor and heavy and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. Yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
So some, what must I do? Well, I like this. I, I come across this verse in Acts chapter 2. When the people heard the, the, the gospel message of this, I suppose it's Peter. And it says, what must we do? And Peter says this verse. And then it, it dawned upon me, yeah, we are supposed to do the same thing. Two. Thirty seven thirty seven Acts chapter two verse thirty seven. So now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remissions of sin, and you shall receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I think it gives me the same kind of idea. What are we to do after we go through this short passage this morning? We, if we have walked away and we have forgotten and we are trying to do go through our life journey alone without our master, then simply we come and repent. Okay, we repent and we and, and we uh, for the, the in the name of Jesus, and we shall receive. Okay. Not only the forgiveness, but we shall be able to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit which will come and aid us in our journey forward. So we just come, as this verse says, we just what to do. And next is we cast our burden, our anxiety upon the Lord. In this uh, Psalms 55 verse 22. Okay. Here, in this verse, is not Jesus' call similar to Jehovah's call to cast our burden in Psalms 55 verse 2. May we all be quick to humble ourselves and willingly cast our burden to Jehovah, on Jehovah. What are the promises Jehovah gives to us when we cast our burden on Him? Cast, that means just put it upon and in the verse says, cast your burden, which is also anxiety upon the Lord, and He will sustain you, and He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Wow. Can you imagine or not? So that is the promise given to you and I. And finally, you and you alone knows what is in your heart, and the present state of your heart, and the spiritual, your own spiritual name spiritual journey with Jesus and you have to find out for yourself who Jesus is and in the same way we have to come and read, even as you read this verse again you just have to reflect you aware that Jesus has been there inviting you all this while, every day, through this passage, through this verse? And have you been able to experience rest in your soul? And this rest, I like to tell, uh, state it clearly. This rest is part of the covenantal privilege coming in this relationship with Christ. Hence, it is not something, it is a it's a gift. It is there already. And you and I just have to go forward and receive it. So what must I do? Actually, I just have to come. With all my brokenness, with all my woundedness, come as just I am this morning. So I would like to close this message this morning. And I invite if there are any of you who is yet to know Jesus, the invitation is there also by Jesus to come to invitation. And you are that kind and that people who is yet to know Him. All you have to do is just say, Lord Jesus, I am in a mess. I have a lot of burden and anxiety. And I need you to give me this rest. And I confess I have sinned and moved away in my life. 
and I invite you now to come into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life and so help me to be the kind of person you want me to be. If you have prayed this prayer, welcome to the family of God and you are in the, 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 this covenant relationship with Christ that you are able to receive the same rest that is given to all of us. For those who are heavy, heavy and burdensome, you only know, I just pray you will continue to meditate and bring yourself to this passage. Most important, bring yourself to Jesus Christ and let him lead you into this divine rest. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask that Lord will continue to be with all of us, even as we continue to ponder and reflect on that word this morning. In this short passage, I pray that you continue to speak to each and every one of us, respectively to our respective station and needs, and hence run us the rest for our souls in a weary journey. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Kelvin, on the Bible rest. Uh, just, a, just a reminder, so we will see you on Friday to Zoom or Facebook Live or next Sunday uh, on site. Okay, so uh, registration will open uh, tomorrow. So thank you for joining us today. God bless you. Jesus' name. Amen.